Welcome to Preaching That Matters. A place you can find apostolic Pentecostal preaching. A place where all generations can be fed with the Word of God. We hope you enjoy. God bless you for that. And may God lead you and guide you in the ways he'd have you to go. I'm going to ask my wife to come and sing for us this morning. You worship God as she sings. Praise the Lord, everybody. I, too, remember so well the day that Brother Enzi came to visit us in Saskatoon. He was scheduled to come, and unfortunately, he couldn't make it the day that he was supposed to arrive. I think he had the mumps, if I remember right. <laughs> and the day he was supposed to have been there, it was 52 degrees below zero, with the wind chill factor of 80 degrees below zero. And when he came a few days later, he said, I'm so glad I wasn't here that day. <laughs> he shivered and shook even while he was there. But there's something very special about the day that he came that I'll never forget. Now, many of you young people are going out to work for the Lord, and God might call you to home missions. And this is something that happened that day that he didn't know about then, and probably I wouldn't have told him then, <laughs> but I'll say it today. When he was supposed to come, you know, we had everything planned. And in home missions, you don't have a lot of money. And so when he didn't come that day, the things that we had planned got eaten up and so on. And so the day he was to arrive, he called from Calgary, I believe at Brother Thurstead's, and said, I'm coming on over on a flight today to Saskatoon. And it was early in the morning, and my husband was just ready to go out the door to go to work because it was not a self-supporting church. And I said, honey, I don't have any meat for supper tonight. What am I going to do? And he said, well, Brother Enzi is a promoter for home missions, and he'll just have to find out what home missions is really like. <laughs> I said, well, that's easy for you to say, but I don't feel that way. He said, well, if we haven't got any money and we haven't got any meat, we just won't be able to have meat. So he went to work. And I got down and I prayed and I said, Lord, I don't want to fix a meal for this man. It's the first time he's ever been in our home. And I don't want to fix it without any meat. Will you please provide some meat for our supper? And we had lots of vegetables. We had a garden. I had nice berries that I could make a pie, but I had no meat. And so after my husband went to work and after I had prayed, my doorbell rang. And a young man from the church rang the doorbell, and he was on his way to work, and he said, I'm in a hurry here, and he handed me an envelope, and it was run out. And I was so shocked because I knew that God had answered my prayer, but this young man just didn't do things like this. He was very tight with his money, and I thought, oh, I can't believe this. And so here he was going. I hadn't even said thank you, so I run out the door and out to his car, and I thanked him, and I went back in the house, I opened the envelope, and there was a $10 bill in there. And I called my husband. I said, honey, would you please come home and take me to the grocery store? I want to go buy some meat. He said, I'm sorry, honey. I just don't have the money. I said, but I've got the money. The Lord sent the money. And so, young people, you may go out into home missions, but God is always there to meet the need. So, Brother Enzi, I shall always remember you because of what the miracle that God worked that day. And now I'd like to share a song with you, I Claim the Blood. I have a sword, I claim those precious blood stains. Praise God. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank God for his shed blood. We're going to take a nation of Finland for a few minutes this morning. Give you an idea of the countryside, the need that is represented in that area. You worship God as we show you the slide this morning. If you have looked on your map, 
The nation of Finland is situated between Sweden and Russia. One third of the country lies north of the Arctic Circle, and in that particular area of Finland, for 70 days during the summer, the sun never sets any lower on the horizon than what you see in this picture, and thus it is known as the land of the midnight sun. We will reside in the southern part, probably in the Helsinki area, and in order to view this, we will have to drive many hundred miles north. My husband and I were privileged to go on an overseas trip last winter, and during that trip, we took three days and went into Finland to see what we could purchase there and what we would have to take with us. We were met at the airport by this young man. This is Brother Yoni Runtella. He is a computer engineer in Helsinki, and for all of you single young ladies, he is single. He's 28 years old. And he is a fantastic Christian young man. About four years ago, Brother Yoni went to Germany to study in computers. And while he was in Germany on his course, one day he was walking through a park in the city of Stuttgart. He heard music and singing, and so he stood and listened to what was going on. And his heart was touched. It was Brother Putnam and the saints from the Stuttgart church having an open-air service. Brother Yoni decided, well, I'll go to church and see what Pentecost is all about. Ninety-six percent of Finland is Lutheran, and Brother Yoni had never been in a Pentecostal service. What an experience he found that night. As he sat through the service, he said, oh, dear, these people are all crazy. And if I get out of here, by the help of God, I'll never be back again. But he sat out of politeness as they danced and shouted and worshipped. And when service was over, he quickly made his exit and went home to his boarding place. But all week long, that service began to nag at his heart, and the nosier he got. And as Sunday drew closer, he just had to go back one more time. Well, it wasn't very many weeks until Brother Yoni was baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of his sins and filled with the beautiful gift of the Holy Ghost. But at the close of that year, he had to return to Helsinki to his job. He went home to Finland not knowing one other person, baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. He did not have any church to attend. We had no United Pentecostal Church in the nation of Finland. Brother Putnam got in touch with Brother Tilly, our missionary in Norway, told him about Brother Yoni. Brother Tilly had also heard of a few other believers in the nation of Finland, so he went over to look up these people. After a period of time, Brother Tilly got some folks together, and they had some meetings. They have had as high as 125 in a house meeting. And Brother Tilly has been privileged to baptize five or six of these folks in the name of Jesus. Brother Yoni speaks English really well, so he interpreted for Brother Tilly. But he lives in Helsinki, and he is several hundred miles from these other believers. So Brother Yoni has served God all by himself for the last three years with no church to attend, no pastor to encourage him, no other young people and believers to worship God with. But this young man dearly loves our message, and he is anxious for a church to start in his nation. I'll share some more about him with you later, but let me so show you some of the countryside. Now, for all you Southerners, to us, this is very beautiful. <laughs> Being from Canada, this is going to be very home-like to us. And, of course, if we can stand 52 below, I guess we can also stand Finland. It is a beautiful country. This is the hotel where we stayed in Helsinki. Looking out our hotel window was the Central Railway Station downtown, and those beautiful long words on that building are Finnish. Some of their words have more letters than the whole alphabet together. But by the help of God, we do want to conquer this language so that we can effectively reach these people with this message. Brother Yoni will be a tremendous asset, but we need the language. This is a summer view of the same building. <clears throat> this was also looking out our hotel window. It's a law in Finland that you must drive with your headlights on at all times. And another law is, that's rather funny to us, you must have wipers on your headlights just as well as on your windshield. This my husband took at night of the same street. It's a beautiful city of about 500,000 people. The northern part of Scandinavia is called Lapland. 
and the northern part of Finland is a land of lakes and a land of much forest land. They're exporters of forest products, of course, Scandinavian furniture, and also large paper manufacturing machines, many of which are shipped here to North America. Even some are here in Texas. Now, this little building beside the lake is a sauna at somebody's cottage, and a sauna is a must in the life of every Finn. Now, I think I'll fit into Finnish life pretty easy, except for this. In the wintertime, in the northern part, when it's very cold and dark, and not a lot of sunlight, their pores don't open properly, and of course that isn't healthy. So how the Finns go about getting around that, they get in these little buildings, they heat them to extremely high temperatures with lots of steam, they sit in there for 15 to 20 minutes and gently beat their body with little birch branches, and then after soaking up all that heat and steam, they run out and jump into the icy cold water. <laughs> Don't you envy us? <laughs> These are three Laplanders in their native costume with a reindeer. And they're owned by private herdsmen. They, they are used for meat, and there are thousands of them. And unfortunately, due to the nuclear disaster in Russia last year, so much of the fallout drifted over into Scandinavia, they've had to kill hundreds of these animals and will have to do so for the next five years. Sister Tilly told me that even over into Norway, they could not use their gardens or eat the berries last year. This is the president's palace. He is elected for a term of six years, and many have asked us, is it a communist country? No, thanks to Munnerheim, it is not. He is the political figure who is responsible for leading Finland to its independence out from under the rule of Russia, out from under the hand of communism in 1917. This piece of work was done by a lady, and it weighs 24 tons. This is the town museum in Helsinki. They do have beautiful summers there, by the way, with even 90-degree temperatures. This is the, the National Museum, and they do drive on the same side of the road as we do, and I'm very thankful for that. This is the Central Post Office, downtown Helsinki. The town theater, and of course, the beautiful fall leaves the National Theater. The Finns are noted for their architecture. In fact, many young people go to Finland to study architecture. They build beautiful homes and beautiful buildings. This is the Finlandy Hall, a convention center in Helsinki. And who knows, someday you might just get a report that we've had a Jesus Name convention in the Helsinki Finlandy Hall. And the Helsinki Stadium where the Olympics was once held. And of course, the Finns are very well known for their sports activities hockey being one of the major things. And they have nice supermarkets there, but they also have the open farmer's market where we can get our fresh vegetables each day. And you can see from this, really, food-wise, we will not have any adjustment. And things are very clean, very well processed. We can even drink the water there without boiling it. This is South Harbor in Helsinki, a very important port to Finland because of its proximity to Stockholm, Sweden as well as to Leningrad, Russia. We will only be 200 miles from Leningrad and an overnight train ride from the city of Moscow and, of course, much closer than even that to the Russian border. To us, this is exciting. And to some, they say, oh, I'd be so fearful. But really, God loves the Russians, too. And we are hoping through the Finns, after a period of time, to make some inroads to our believers in the land of Russia. I'm sure you young people are all familiar with McDonald's. And to let you know the cost of living in Helsinki, we went here one day for lunch. We each had a quarter pounder with cheese, a small fry, a medium drink, and a hot apple turnover. And it cost my husband and I 12 American dollars for our lunch. So needless to say, we'll be dining in Kinney's Kitchen most of the time. When we mention missions, Automatically, our mind goes to third world nations where people live in extreme poverty and have very little of this world's goods and yet are very open and receptive to the gospel messages it's ministered unto them. But not so with Europe. You are looking at a totally different aspect of missions. People don't live in mud huts <clears throat> with straw thatched roofs. Of course, it would never work there in all the cold weather, but they do have beautiful homes. 
and they have nice shops in which to buy their groceries and all the other things that they want to purchase. You can even get many of the brand names that you buy here at home. And all, a lot of our missionaries have to go to open flea markets and beat off the bugs to see what they're even buying, but not so in Finland. As we walked along the streets, we observed that at least 50% or maybe more of all the ladies wore fur coats and hats. Most of the men had beautiful fur hats. This spoke to us that this is not a poverty-stricken country. You have to have money to purchase these things. In fact, Finland is an exporter of mink and fox. They're very educated. It is one of the highest systems of education in all of Europe. They drive nice automobiles. This was Brother Yoni's Mercedes. Now, don't all you boys get green with envy. And you'll notice the wipers on his headlights. In fact, in Helsinki, all of the taxis were Mercedes. So we are not going to a poverty-stricken third-world nation. But the reason I tell you that is this. When our missionaries have to work under the circumstances of such a high rate of materialism and so many high walls as far as the traditions of religion are concerned, this creates many high walls, many barriers, and extreme pressures to work under. But we know this morning that Jesus Christ is bigger than any mountain that we can or cannot see. And he can help us to penetrate into the hearts and lives of these people. If we were going to Finland to take them church buildings, we might just as well stay right here at home. We would never have the finances to match some of the beautiful structures that they already have erected in which they worship. Such as this sanctuary. This has been hewn out of solid rock. And the brown dome on top is made of copper. But the sad thing about this beautiful picture is that the truth is never proclaimed across that pulpit. And you young people are so privileged to know the Lord in the truth. People come to this church with cares and problems. They sit through a dead, dry, formal service and leave the same way they came. While we were in Finland, we attended two uh, Trinitarian Pentecostal services. And sad to say, they were so dry and formal, they had nothing to offer the people. But we are not going to take them another beautiful sanctuary, but we are going to take them a beautiful name, a name that is above all names. As you look into the faces of these Finns, you could be looking at any typical American, because basically they live a very similar lifestyle to ours. They dress like we dress. They're... they're uh, culture is much like ours, although there are some differences. But nobody yet has ever gone to this people with this message other than the little bit that Brother Tilly has tried so hard to work in there under his limited budget. But we are thankful today that God has called us and we are anxious to go to Finland. Brother Yoni told us that sometimes the burden for his country has become so heavy that many times he has fasted two weeks at a time. Many nights he has lain on his face all night long before the Lord, asking God, please won't you send a missionary to my people. Young people, this man has done this for three years without any pastor to encourage him. Could you live for God alone for three years? You may feel it's close with your roommate and you would like some breath of fresh air once in a while, but this young man would love to have some fellowship where he could worship God with somebody else. He has many contacts, but nowhere to invite them to go to church. He brought Christina to our hotel, hoping that she would allow us to baptize her in Jesus' name. But only being there for three short days was not enough time to get close enough to her to help her realize there was more in Jesus for her than what she already had. But someday, when we return to Finland, I'm asking God to give us this young lady as an overcoming Christian for the church in Finland. The Finns are not emotional people in public, and especially so the men. It is a sign of weakness of character if a man should weep before others. But as we stood at the airport to bid Brother Yoni goodbye, the tears began to flow down his cheeks. And he said, Brother and Sister Kenny, I really like you a lot, but will you come back to Finland? He said, It is so hard for me to believe that you're willing to leave your nation and your families 
and come to my cold country. Are you sure you're coming back? And we told him, Brother Yoni, if the missions board will appoint us, we will be back. This was last January. We had already applied to go at that time, but we did not meet the board until May. And, of course, after that, we had to resign our church and then deputize to raise our budget. So we told him, Brother Yoni, there is no possible way we can be back before the summer of 87 or maybe even toward the end of 87, which would be almost two years. And he began to weep again, and he said, But, Brother and Sister Kenny, that's a long time to wait for a pastor. And so we are anxious to go to this nation with this message. And we would invite you young people today to become one of our partners to help us evangelize the nation of Finland. And at the little display out by the door as you leave are some prayer cards. And we would appreciate it very much if each one of you would take a prayer card and place Finland on your prayer list and ask God to give us a mighty outpouring of his spirit in this nation before he comes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. We are so privileged today to know the truth and to have the truth. I know that that young boy needed a haircut, but I wonder what some of us would look like if we had to go three years on a pastor. Amen. It was amazing. It is amazing what God can do, though, with a heart that is open. That young man was saved likely less than nine months before he went back into Finland all by himself. But then that young man asked us what we believed about baptism. He asked us what we believed about one God. He said, Brother Kinney, in your part of the country, he said, it's cold in the wintertime, isn't it? I said, very cold. And uh, he asked us about, about two days after we were there. I hardly know how to answer him. He said, does women wear slacks in that cold? I didn't know what he was fishing for. I had no idea. And so I just said, well, if they're spiritual, they don't. And here's this young man's answer. He said, I don't believe that the Bible teaches it. No matter how cold it is, it doesn't give a person an excuse to do it. And when I seen what that young man had received from God, amen. God's going to bring some folks up like that in the judgment for people that said they couldn't live for God. And they couldn't understand the scripture when here's a young boy that's been back in the Finland for three years all by himself. And God has opened the word of the Lord up to him. Hallelujah. Thank God for truth. Amen. Can you say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. We're going to turn the 20th chapter of Acts. And I know you get out at 1230. And I taught at the Bible school for three years. And I know that they live to the law. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. In fact, they tried to shove it just a little bit, especially when it was time for class to get out. I want to leave with your thought this morning, though, if you'll allow me to, and I want to say it is our privilege again to be with Brother Enzi and you folks here at TBC. And uh, our prayer is that God would give you leadership and guidance. I was going to talk to you about our call, how that God called us. And when I was in prayer this morning, God directed me to this portion of Scripture. Uh, let's go down to verse uh, 22 of the 20, 20th chapter of Acts. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Say that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. In the 21st chapter and the 11th verse, And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, So shall the Jews of Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle, and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, 
What mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Father, we're grateful today for thy word and for your spirit that we feel. We're grateful, Lord, that we can stand before these young men and women that have dedicated their lives, oh God, to the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for the staff members today. We pray you would bless them and touch them. Help us to minister today, we pray. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. This is a bad time of year for me. My feet runs and, and uh, or my, my, uh, my feet doesn't run. My nose runs and my feet smell. I'm allergic to everything that's around this time of year. And uh, if I have to sneeze or something during my message, you would pardon me, please. I stole that saying from Brother Chambers one time. And he was a general superintendent. And he said it. <laughs> Amen. But I want to preach to you from uh, uh, a couple of three words out of the 24th verse of Scripture in the 20th chapter. Paul said, but none of these things move me. I would like to preach to you this morning about things that do move us. And there are things that move us this morning. Maybe sometimes they move us in the wrong direction, but we are moved by things because we are people of emotion. We're moved by excitement. We're moved by joy. We're moved by sorrow. We're moved by anger. We're moved by envy. We're moved by all kinds of things. We're moved by death. We're moved by jealousy. There are just all kinds of things. Tragedy, surprises. They just on the list could go. I remember if you've ever had the sad displeasure of your mom or dad ever passing away, uh, you will know what it is, that how that death can affect you. You will know how it is when you get the call. You will never forget it. You always remember these things. It is more indelibly impressed upon your mind, amen, how that these things affect us. And we, we see things and they affect us. We have things in the Word of God where people were moved. Uh, we read in the first chapter of Ruth, where the Bible said when Naomi come back from the land of Moab, all of the city of Bethlehem, Judah, when they saw her, they were moved because of her. And they asked the question, they said, is this Naomi? She had changed so much from the time that she had left until the time that she came back to the city. And Naomi made the statement to the people of the land of Bethlehem, Judah, and she said, God had dealt very bitterly with me. She said, I went out full, and I came back empty. I really don't think that was a fair accusation. But be that as it may, I believe the reason that Naomi came back empty, she did not go out because God wanted her to go. They went to the land of Moab because they wanted to go there. And I want you to know, if you ever decide to leave this church, amen, I want you to know you will go out full. And if you ever come back, you will come back empty. That was the problem with the oh my. Amen. And when the city saw her, there was something inside of them that said, Is this really Naomi? They were so moved by what they saw. They said, Surely this can't be the one that was called Naomi. Amen. That we knew. Her husband was gone. Her two sons were gone. Amen. And all that she came back with was one daughter in law. I read just yesterday where David cried out about the death of his son Absalom. He said, oh, Absalom, my son, my son. He said, I would to God I had died for thee. When, when David heard about the death of Absalom, there was something inside of David that was moved. Amen. He will never forget the words and the tidings that came to him that told him that his son Absalom was dead. I want you to know we are moved by things. We really are. We're creatures of emotion. I remember talking to a lady one time in the city of Saskatoon. I was knocking doors. And she said, in our church, we worship way, 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 way down in our hearts. So far down that they didn't worship. Got to bury it up somewhere. Amen. Amen. But uh, we're moved by things. And we respond to the Spirit of God when God begins to move upon us, but uh, we look at it this morning, and in your lifetime, no doubt there are things that you have been moved by. I can remember things that have happened in my life that I will never forget, never forget, because I was moved by them. I remember as a child, we used to slide in the wintertime on the snow. We used to have what we call hand sleds, and they were made out of wood and metal, and around the front there was a little what we called a 
little bumper bar, and it was round, and it was made out of metal, and when it was cold in the winter, and the frost would get on that, and when you slid down the hill and went back up to the top, this thing looked really enticing. You was out of breath. You was thirsty. Your mom told you not to eat snow because there was germs in it. And you'd look at that little bar of metal with that frost on it and say, boy, if I could just lay my tongue on that for just a little bit. And I did. And when I laid my tongue on that piece of metal with that frost on there, it grabbed on there. Even like an alligator would grab onto your foot. And when it did, I pulled my tongue off. If I had had brains, I'd have left it on there until it thawed out. But I pulled it off, and I left just about uh, so much of my skin that it felt like it laying on that piece of metal. If you've ever had that experience, you'll never, ever forget it. You'll never forget it. Because we're moved by these things. We're moved by disappointment. We're moved by all of these things. We're moved by tragedy. Sometimes we're moved by a new home. Sometimes we're moved by a new car. Sometimes even people are moved by trials. They're moved by tribulations. They're moved by persecutions. All of these things that we allow to move us, sometimes they move us away from God. This ought not to be. There are some people that can get more excited about a new car than they can about testifying about what God's done for them. That is not the will of God. Paul said... He said, all of these things that you folks have talked about, he said, they do not move me. He said, persecution doesn't move me. Trials don't move me. He said, they do not affect me. But I want you to know something, friend. There was a lot of things that did not move Paul in the 8th chapter of Romans. He said, I'm persuaded that life, nor death, nor things present, nor things to come, heaven, or trials, or tribulations, or mountain tops, or, or ocean voyages, whatever it is, he said, none of these things move me. You know, sometimes you talk to people and they say, I'm not going back to church again. Why ain't you going back to church again? Well, sister so-and-so said something about me, I'm not going back to church. Her brother so-and-so said this about me, and I'm not going back to church. What the man ought to have done was fell on his knees and got a hold of God and give him a little bit more grace. Hallelujah. He should not have been moved to the place where it took him away from God. He should have allowed that thing that became a trial, heaven that became a stumbling block in his way. He should have allowed that thing to move him to God where he could have found more grace and where he could have found more power and where he could have found more forgiveness and where he could have found more love. Amen. And many times when things of life beset us, amen, we fall into the trap that the devil sets for us instead of falling into the grace of God where God can give us power and enablement amen, to overcome these obstacles that come in our way. Paul said, none of these things move me. He said, it really doesn't bother me. Amen. Some say that Paul quit Asia, you know, because of persecution. I don't think this is really true of Paul. I don't think that Paul was scared of persecution. I really don't. I, I, I really think that uh, some say that uh, he was like a coward, you know, running away from the post of danger. I don't believe that Paul was a coward at all. I believe Paul was a hero. Amen. I believe that Paul, Paul was the father of the faithful. Praise the Lord. I believe he was one that left an example. Amen. That he was moved by the right things. Amen. He, but I believe that he was like a hero hastening to the very high places. But the battle, where it was like you'd have cost him the most. You know, we live in a society that we try to get by with the least. But Paul was that type of man where wherever it cost him the most, that's where he found himself. We right. isn't privileged to be in Guatemala or El Salvador in the fall of 1982. And Brother Windross made this statement to me. He said, Brother Kenny, if I had a left El Salvador back in the 70s when the foreign missionary board wanted me to come home because there was so much persecution and because there were so many killings and our lives was in danger and my children's lives were in danger my wife's life was in danger but he said if I had to come home at that time he said I would never have dared to go back to El Salvador today he said they'd have called me a coward they'd have called me a chicken they'd have called me a traitor he said what moved me the most heaven was not my own personal safety but it was the people that needed to be baptized in Jesus name there was brand new babies there that needed somebody to stand and say, I'm willing ever to be moved ever by the things that move the hand of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And the reason that there are thousands of 
people in El Salvador today that are baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost is because somebody even allowed themselves to be moved with a burden for lost souls rather than allow the circumstances that surrounded it to influence them. From the very time that Brother Dross went there to that nation, they tried to get rid of him. There was the oneness group of people that tried to blackmail his name. And they told the government all kinds of stories about him. They tried to get him deported out of the country. But he said, I'm here to stay. Hallelujah. There's a church in El Salvador. Hallelujah. And I want you to know something. There's going to be times in your life, even when things are going to fall upon you, and you're going to be moved maybe to do the wrong thing. Even, but just remember the words of the Apostle Paul when he said, none of these things move me. Don't cry. Don't weep for me. Don't mourn. Even, I've got a job to do. Hallelujah. I've got a job to do. Friend, I want you to know. Even Paul left us an example of holy courage and resolution. He made no account of the things that happened yesterday. He just pressed on. Him and Paul knew what it was to burn the bridges. He knew what it was to burn the bridges. I want you to know something. Christ in heaven was what moved him. Things didn't move him back when he saw the storm coming, friend. It just gave him more determination to go on. It just gave him more zeal. It just gave him more spunk. It just gave him more of something that wound up inside of him and said, I've got to preach this gospel. I've got to do what God has been me to do, regardless of what it's going to cost me a life. Hallelujah. You read in the 14th chapter of Acts, when he went to the city of Leicester, and they stoned him the three months out of the city for dead. When he crawled out of that pile of rocks, he did not get up and run. The Bible said he went back into Lystra and spent the night. He was not scared what man could do to him. He was concerned what he could do for humanity. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I want you to know something in the midst of trouble. He was as one unconcerned. There was something about him, friend. He had a holy contempt of life. He despised it. I want you to know something. Paul had no use for his flesh. Amen. Because all our flesh can do is get us in trouble. <laughs> Amen. He had no use for his life. He said, neither count I my life dear unto myself. Paul said, I die daily. He said, every day that I rise out of bed, he said, I say, oh, God, I've got to kill my flesh today. I've got to die. All that a man has will he give for his life. But all that a man has in life too will he give. Will he give who understands himself aright in his own interest rather than lose the favor of God and hazard eternal life. I want you to know something. The only thing that we're going to have when we stand before God is what we've done for him. Because when we leave this world, folks, everything that you've got, you're going to leave it behind. Everything. All of our homes, all of our cars, all of our clothes. Amen. What people thought of us in this life, we're going to leave it all behind. And the only thing that you're going to have to give to God. Amen. My boy said, but he said, oh, daddy said, wouldn't it be really something? Of course, this is a young teenager. Amen. Thinking out loud. And he said, oh, it would be so nice if we had, you know, had this and had that and had something else. And I said, son, amen, all of that stuff is good in this life. None whatsoever. And a lot of times we look at this world and we're moved by things that are in this world. But let me tell you something tonight or this, this afternoon. The only thing that needs to move us is our own eternal welfare and the eternal welfare of other people that is in this world. Hallelujah, hallelujah. He had a holy concern that he will never to save his life lose the ends of living. Amen. Paul said, I will do anything, amen, to save my life, but I will not lose the ends of living while I'm doing it. Praise the Lord. Amen. He had two things in mind, that he may be found faithful and that he may finish well. That was the two things in Paul's mind. Amen. It was not to impress anybody. If you've read your papers, amen, the last few days, I'll tell you, it's really sad. I made a statement last night in Conroe. I said, the only folks that can hurt this church are you that are sitting inside of it. And there's only the only people that can affect TBC, Brother Enzi, are the people that are in the walls of this building today. The world can't hurt us. The world can't affect us. 
And we've got all this garbage going on. And then about all these TV preachers and all of that. And I'm telling you, it's going to have an effect upon uh, we that are the true church of Jesus Christ. But we must not uh, relegate and go to our pulpits and say all of this stuff about them. Even because, friend, that's not going to do us any good. If we'd exalt the name of Jesus, hallelujah. If we lift him up high, praise the Lord. If we'll exalt the name of the Lord, God, heaven will look after the church. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I want you to know we had in mind that he might finish well. Hallelujah. Young person, you that are aspiring to be called to the ministry, the only person really that you're interested in is what God thinks of you. It's not how about anybody else thinks of you. It's what God thinks of you. He's the one we answer to. I'm not going over your Bible school president. I don't want you to misunderstand me this morning. But I want you to know something. We're in this thing and he's our captain. We've got to be concerned about what God thinks of us. And I'll tell you what God thought of Noah Amen. A lot of other people didn't think about him. Amen. There's going to be times in your life when you're going to be the only man that's going to stand in the church. For a right. Amen. Everybody else may be against you, but when you've heard from God, friend, you've got all of heaven behind you. Hallelujah. 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 That's got to be the thing that moves us in this world that we live in. It's got to be the things that move the heart of God that moves we, his children today. You know, sometimes the things that move us in life are uh, really the things that have no lasting value in this world and absolutely none in eternity. You say, well, I know this person. They got a million bucks and they got a billion bucks and all of this. That's, God's, that, that doesn't impress God. It really doesn't. The thing that really impresses God. One time, Jeremiah said Israel has given themselves over to things that will profit them nothing. And we waste our time sometimes, so many times, at things that does not profit us at all. Doesn't profit us. Amen. Amen. We put preeminence in things that God is not even interested in. We really do, folks. Amen. I, I've said this before, and I, I love good singing, but I want to tell you, I think sometimes we put too much professionalism into singing. Where God has no chance to move. He has no chance to break in with the Holy Ghost. Amen. I thought as Brother Angie was reading this letter from Brother Urshan, I have read things about when Pentecost first come in this area of the country and out in California where choirs would stand and sing in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance and they would be in perfect harmony. The Holy Ghost done it. The Holy Ghost done it. But the things that move us today ought to be the things that move the heart of Almighty God. The Bible said when Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. Hallelujah. What was it that moved Paul? We found out what it wasn't. Trials didn't move him. Shipwrecks didn't move him. Paul said, I'm free from the blood of all men. What was it this morning that moved our fathers to do what they did? Have you ever read that book, One More Place by Brother Kenneth French, missionary to Alaska many, many years ago? And in that book it said that he would go from one place port to another he would unload his suitcase and a few trunks maybe a couple of trunks and a little bit of clothes and leave his wife and family sitting on him on the dock while he went to find a place to live he would start a church in one area of Alaska he'd pack up and they'd go up the coast a ways further and do it all over again and the reason today that there are churches in some of the places of Alaska, it's because a man said, I want to be moved by the things that God is moved with. All of this world. There's a missionary today. He's just about done as far as his strength is concerned. In the jungles of Peru, his name is Brother Paul Moulton. He may have been here sometime. I don't know. But he's just about 65 years old. He's been in Peru. He keeps his Peru for almost 20 years. When he left to go to Peru, he had electrical business. Him and his brother-in-law operated. One of the best in the city that he lived in. And he looked at it, Brother Enzi, and he said, What satisfaction am I getting out of this thing? What eternal rewards will I have? And when Brother Moulton was about 45 years old, he said, I'm going to go to the jungles of Peru. 
I know that it's going to be hard on my health. He went to the doctor a while ago, and the doctor told him, he said, Preacher, you're just done. You're burnt out. You're all, it's over with. But there's still something in the heart of that missionary. Amen. Of that man of God that says, I've got to do what I can in the jungles of Peru. Well, I've still got strength. There's folks here that need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's the thing that moves him. I knew a young man, and I got nothing against young men. I was a young man myself. I still am. But I knew a young man one time that went to a church, and there was a need there. There was thousands of people. There was no pastor, and he said, it's not enough money. Not enough money. And I'm not being critical. I feel sorry for that young man because somewhere that young man relegated something to the ministry that God never intended for them to be relegated to the ministry. The ministry is not controlled by money. Your ministry and what you do in this world will not be controlled by what you get. It will be controlled about what you're moved by. If it's the souls of men, or what is it? Amen. God wants us to feel the hurt of this world. I don't know if you've read your paper. i got to quit. But in the last two weeks in the Houston Chronicle, day after day has been all these suicides. I tell you, I get to praying one day. And they got to hold me, Brother Enzi. We say this world don't want what we've got. I don't believe that. We say this world won't live like we live. We live so strict and so, you know, separate from the world. I don't believe that garbage. They're not satisfied with what they've got. Why are they committing suicide? Why are 18-year-olds and 19-year-olds and 17-year-olds and 20-year-olds even just in and all? Because there's no purpose to their life. They've got nothing to live for. But, oh, God, there's a world out there. And they're waiting for us, folks. They really are. And we can't see them as trees walking. We've got to see them as they really are. They're a soul that's going to spend eternity somewhere. Either in the presence of Jesus Christ or without him. And we can change the destiny of the souls of men and women when we're moved by compassion. And we see them as an everlasting soul that's going to live somewhere in eternity. Paul said, forget about my trials. Forget about me being bound in Jerusalem. He said, I'm ready to preach the gospel. I'm ready to do the will of God. I'm ready to move. I'm ready to move. I'm ready to move because there's some folks that are waiting for me. Hallelujah. I've got to preach the gospel to them. Let me tell you, Bible college students this morning, allow God to move you by the things that move him. Hallelujah. The hurt of this world. Amen. The tears that are shed. Amen for satisfaction and for reality. Allow that to be the thing that moves us and say, oh God, may I never lose sight of why you brought me out of a world of sin and brought me into this beautiful truth that I'm in this morning. Let's stand and love the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. I am moved today by this preaching and by this beautiful presentation of Sister Kenny in these slides. I want us to pray for Brother Yoni right now. I don't know where he is or what he's doing at this, at this moment, but God knows, and I just feel like we ought to pray for him. That God would strengthen him and help him to prepare the way for the coming of these missionaries and that he could be a great soul winner in that country. Would you pray for Brother Yoni right now? In Jesus' name, mighty God, mighty God, lift him up, Lord, and encourage him. Put your arms around him. Let him feel your presence and your love. Hallelujah. My God, my God. Help him to prepare the way for the coming of these missionaries, Lord. Oh, God, use him, Jesus. Let him be a soul winner, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah.
want us to pray for Brother and Sister Kenny and the work there in Finland. And I want us to go with them as they go. We're going to go in prayer and we're going to go with our finances. Wouldn't you like to support them? Uh, it may be that some of you want to pick up a little bit on your faith promise or some way. And let's, uh, let's invest in Finland. What do you say? And send the gospel there so they can know as we know. I want us to pray that God will supply their needs. They're on deputational work now and uh, are in need of being on the field. God knows how to supply the needs. He really does. All this is necessary too and the exposure of it all. But let's pray that God will speed their uh, way and they can reach the field uh, in, in quickly and with all the finances they need. Would you do that in Jesus' name, Lord? We simply pray that somehow miracles will be wrought, God, and that these folks with a burden in the vision that they carry today can be set on the soil of Finland quickly so that the work of God can be done before you come. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Let it be so, Lord, and let a burden touch every one of us today to increase our giving and to be faithful. Praise God. In Jesus' name, praise God, praise God, praise God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Before you go, I need to make a quick announcement here.